My name is Mark Peel. I'm the archivist for the Historical and Cultural Society of Clay County. And today I want to talk about a real colorful period in Moorhead's history. That's its saloon era, 1890 to 1915. Now down here at the museum we get a lot of questions about Moorhead's past and people ask, uh, well, weren't there a lot of saloons in Moorhead back in the old days? And we have to say, yeah, there were. In the uh, year 1900, there were 45 saloons operating in Moorhead. The population of the time is about 3,700. If you do the math, that's about one saloon for every 80 people in town. Uh, if you can imagine Dilworth today with about 50 bars, that's what Moorhead was like. Now I'm going to be talking about a long period of time here, 25 years, from 1890 to 1915. There was a lot of change in the community during that time, so I'll be talking about community change as much as I will be about the saloons themselves. To give you a sense of what things were like here in Moorhead, uh, if we went back in time, say, to the fall of 1897 when this picture was taken, we're looking east here in this photo on Center Avenue from 4th Street, uh, the Moorhead Center Mall parking lot would be where those buildings are on the left. And uh, in the fall of 1897, there were 41 bars operating in Moorhead. Uh, they were open 24-7. Uh, illegal gambling was going on in many of them. Street crime was a significant problem. Uh, muggings on the Main Avenue Bridge were practically a nightly occurrence. Taxes were sky high and rising, and the city was deeply in debt. There was a flourishing red light district, and uh, many of the city fathers were frankly taking bribes. I have to wonder, Moorhead is a nice place to live today. How in heaven's name did they get in, into such a pickle back in the 1890s? Well, really, to get to it, you've got to go back to the very earliest days of Fargo and Moorhead. And of course, bo both communities were established in 1871-72 when the Northern Pacific Railway reached the Red River. Until the railroad reached the river, there was no Fargo, there was no Moorhead. It was just open prairie around here. But everybody knew that wherever the railroad crossed the river, major cities had developed. And it's basically it's because it's a water source. And both cities, Fargo and Moorhead, grew very quickly at first. Uh, but Fargo grew much faster in the 1870s than Moorhead did. Uh, one of the reasons for that was uh, lot prices in Moorhead uh, were considerably higher than they were over in Fargo. Real estate was more expensive in Moorhead. So Fargo got a jump on the, on the city of Moorhead. But in the early 1880s, that turned around, and suddenly lot prices, real estate prices in Moorhead were competitive with Fargo. Uh, there was a huge building boom in the early 1880s in Moorhead. This picture is looking to the northwest from the top of a, a grain elevator that sat right where Shields is in downtown Moorhead today. We're looking at Center Avenue and 4th Street in the distance off there. The photographer went back five years later, this is 1879, took another photo five years later in 1884, and this is what the city looked like. All those little wood frame buildings down along Center Avenue have been replaced with big substantial brick buildings. Now, unfortunately, like most of the booms that we have here in the Red River Valley, this one collapsed almost as soon as it began. People didn't come flocking into Moorhead by the thousands like people had anticipated, and all of these buildings down on Center Avenue were built with borrowed money in anticipation of the arrival of these folks. Well, when that didn't happen, a lot of people lost their shirts. And it, it, it wasn't just private individuals that lost out in the 1880s. Uh, the city of Moorhead made a lot of investments. They built a new city hall and fire station right downtown. They made improvements on the streets. They put in a water system and a whole new sewer system. Uh, with Fargo, they built a couple of bridges. Spent a lot of money on those. This is the South Bridge, or the Main Avenue Bridge. In this case, we're looking over toward Fargo in the distance. This is during the flood of 1897. And then just a few blocks to the north, uh, they built a second wagon bridge, and that's the North Bridge. It ran from NP Avenue in Fargo to the northeast up to where American Crystal Sugar has their downtown headquarters, just northwest of the Moorhead Center Mall. This bridge isn't there anymore. So both cities invested heavily, and Moorhead really lost out. Like I say, a lot of people lost their shirts in this, in this time period. The 1880s were not a good time for the city of Moorhead. And another thing, people developed, I think, kind of a cynical attitude about their city government. 
And frankly, I think people in Moorhead in the 1880s were ill-served by their city government. There were a number of scandals. One of the chiefs of police had to resign in disgrace. So did one of the mayors. The city treasurer wound up in Stillwater Penitentiary for embezzling funds. So I think even more importantly than the financial reverses that the city faced, uh, people really did become cynical about their government. They didn't expect much from their city government. They didn't get much from their city government. But in 1890, over in North Dakota, something happened to change Fargo or Moorhead for quite some time. In 1889, North Dakota entered the Union with a provision in its constitution that said all the saloons in North Dakota had to close on the 30th of June, 1890, but they could remain open, of course, over in Moorhead. So the very next day, the first day of July, 1890, a number of saloon owners from Fargo moved over to Moorhead and set up shop, and it just grew like topsy from there. Uh, by the middle 1890s, two railroad car loads of beer were going through the city of Moorhead every single day. It's difficult to overemphasize the impact that alcohol had on Moorhead during this time period. It brought a lot of money into the community. A lot of people made a lot of money. A few people made a great deal of money. But it also brought huge problems for the community. This is A.J. Rusted's saloon. A.J. Rusted is building this new saloon in 1905. Uh, right on the main avenue bridge. He had had another saloon in another part of town, but he wanted to be just as close to his customers as he possibly could. Now earlier I said there was one saloon in, or one saloon in Moorhead for every 80 people. It wasn't Moorhead people that were supporting these saloons. It was people coming from dry North Dakota. So uh, Rust had wanted to be just as close to his customers as he could, kind of first chance, last chance kind of a deal. So he, he bought the steep riverbank and actually built part of his saloon out on up on stilts. It hung out over the river, be just as close to his customers as he could. This is a map that shows the location of saloons in Moorhead very early in this period in 1891. Uh, here's the Main Avenue Bridge right here, the South Bridge. Here's the North Bridge up here, and each one of these squares is a saloon. So you can see in an early period most of the saloons were stretched out along Center Avenue, what was called Front Street in those days. Now over in Fargo, Front Street is what we now call Main Avenue. And it used to confuse people. People would come over on Front Street on, in Fargo, come over to Moorhead, and all of a sudden Front Street is a block north. So late in 1923, the city of Moorhead changed the name Front Street to Center Avenue. But that's where most of the saloons were stretched out here, around 4th Street and Center Avenue. We have another map that was done later in the period, 1914, right toward the end of the period, that shows the location of the saloons. This is where they were in 1891, and this is where they were in 1914. You can see they've changed considerably. Most of the saloons are congregated now around the ends of the two bridges, again, trying to be just as close to Fargo as they could. The North Bridge Saloon District up here, and the Main Avenue Bridge uh, Saloon District down here. This is Main Avenue between 1910 and 1915. We're looking to the west here from 4th Street, and uh, you can see the, real, the bridge off in the distance to Fargo. Uh, almost all of these buildings here along the north side of Main Avenue are all saloons. Uh, right here in this corner uh, on the left is the Kassenborg block. It was built in 1898, not as a saloon building, uh, but as a regular business. There was a dry goods store in there upstairs. There were some doctors and dentists had their offices, uh, a number of apartments in there. Uh, a local minister had his apartment up there, uh, right across the street from the saloon district right here. Around the corner on 4th Street, it was much the same thing. On the west side of 4th Street, almost all, all the way to the railroad tracks here, these were almost all saloons here. Across the street to the right, uh, there was regular businesses. At the North Bridge, it was a similar situation. Saloons are really packed around this area as well. Uh, all, this is looking to the east from the top of Case Plaza in, uh, what, in Fargo, a big yellow brick building between First Avenue North and NP Avenue. And uh, all, almost all of these buildings here uh, are saloons. Uh, a number of the more gaudy, flashy saloons were in this district up here. The House of Lords, uh, Billy Demert's place, later known as the Three Orphans Saloon, is the first place you came to on the left as you came across the bridge. 
and likewise the midway, the first place you came to on the right as you crossed the bridge. This is the bridge, of course, and uh, a big concrete footing still sticks out of the river south of the First Avenue North Bridge, and that's the base of this bridge here. You can still see it. This is another shot of the North Bridge Saloon District. We're looking south here toward the midway in the distance. You can see the streetcar tracks. Uh, Fargo Moorhead Electric Leaks powered street railway system. The tracks hung right here, went across the bridge over toward Fargo. And in this uh, neighborhood right here, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven saloons on this one block. They're really pack packed in there. One of them was the Rascaler, one of the more famous saloons in Moorhead. Uh, it was built by Tommy Erdell. Thomas Erdell was a German immigrant. He came to the United States and uh, settled in Philadelphia. Uh, in the 1880s, he moved out to Dakota Territory and Fargo. Uh, he owned a brewery in Fargo until uh, Prohibition shut him down in 1890. And he moved to Moorhead, and he opened a one of a series of saloons here in town. In 1904, he built the Rathskeller over the Rhine, a very famous, fabulous saloon in, in uh, Erbdell spent uh, all kinds of money on fancy marble flooring, uh, hand-carved walnut ceilings, uh, uh, ornate furniture. He had a German band that would sit out on the veranda out here and play tunes for people to uh, entice them into the uh, saloon. Now, later on, the uh, decades ago, the Rascal had kind of an unsavory reputation among people here in Moorhead. And one of the reasons it may have been uh, thought of that way is because it was one of the last of the old saloon buildings to be torn down during urban renewal. Uh, this is what it looked like in 1970, just before it was demolished. They'd added uh, a second story had been added, and this is apartments now at this time. There was a little grocery store in the corner. But the main reason uh, I think that it had a reputation is because of a famous tunnel that ran from the basement of the saloon to the basement of this house next door. There was a lot of question about why did was there a tunnel between these two places. Well, uh, actually, Tommy Erdell actually owned that house next door, and he built this tunnel. This is a photo uh, from the Fargo Forum that Wayne Lubinaw took in 1970, uh, showing the tunnel running from the basement of the Rascaler to the house next door. Well, t Tommy Erdell lived in that house next door. So this tunnel made it easy for him to go back and forth between his place of, of living and his, his uh, business establishment. Also, he was able to use a single heating plant to heat both properties. Uh, so that was basically why he built the tunnel. But in 1913, uh, Burdell turned over the business and the house next door to a couple of brothers who did not run it with the same high standards. In fact, uh, yeah, there was a house of ill fame in that house next door. And the idea was uh, one could go through the front door of the of the Rascaler, go downstairs, go go next door, and then come back out through the front door of the Rascaler and not be seen going into this house of ill fame. That's the story anyway. Uh, but everybody in town knew there was a tunnel there. There was no secret about this, so I don't know who they were trying to fool. Uh, the first place you came to on the right as you came across the bridge was Johnny Haas's Midway Saloon and Cafe. Uh, and of all the gaudy, flashy, over-the-top saloons, uh, the Midway was probably the uh, the most famous. Uh, this is just the lobby of the saloon. It really was uh, quite a fabulous place. Tommy Erdell spent a ton of money on this place, and in fact, in 1898, he spent five thousand dollars on an, uh, on this orchestrion. It's a kind of a mechanical band that's more like a hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars today. And uh, it was basically to impress his customers, and it really did. We have a recording of a similar machine uh, uh, to give you a sense of what, what this would have sounded like. I want to play a little bit of this for you. Well, you get the idea. Uh, this is an advertisement from the Moorhead Daily News early in 1898 for the Midway. Here it says, John Hosh, proprietor, palatial, richly decorated and furnished, brilliantly illuminated with 400 electric lamps. And electricity in the saloons is a big part of the story, and I'll talk more about that later. Now, uh, 110, 120 years ago, agriculture, like everything else in the Red River Valley, basically was seasonal. Um, 
in in the fall, hundreds and hundreds of mostly unattached young males would come pouring into the Red River Valley to work in the wheat harvest. It took maybe 15 guys to run a steam threshing crew. One guy can do the same thing with the uh, with a combine today. A lot of these guys we'd call migrant workers today. They'd spend the winters up in northern Minnesota cutting timber for the lumber industry. Come spring, when the ground got to be too soft to, to handle big loads like this, these guys would hop onto freight trains and head south onto Texas and Oklahoma. And then as the wheat harvest progressed north, they'd ride back up north, arrive here in August and September and October of 19, er, in the fall, and uh, help with the harvest up here. And occasionally they cause problems. Uh, crime and liquor were also seasonal. Uh, this is a graph that shows the arrests by month between 1901 and 1903. Uh, the red line shows the total arrests. The, the blue line shows alcohol-related arrests, uh, arrests, and you can certainly see a correlation. Uh, it was pretty quiet throughout the winter. Finally, about August or so, when these guys start showing up here in large numbers, the numbers just spike. They reach a peak in October and then very quickly drop off once the harvest was done. About 85% of the crime in the early 20th century in Moorhead was alcohol related. And there were some shady characters. Like I mentioned, muggings on the Main Avenue Bridge were practically a nightly occurrence in the 1890s. It was a long, narrow bridge, poorly lit throughout most of the period. Uh, some people, if they had to go across this bridge after dark, they went armed for their own protection. Other people walked blocks out of the way to cross on the North Bridge, which is somewhat less dangerous. There was also a flourishing red light district in the 1890s in Moorhead. It's not something we're real proud of today, but it's a fact. A lot of people assume it was associated with the saloons downtown, down toward the river. But actually, from the earliest days of Moorhead, the red light district is always segregated out on the east edge of town, or actually a couple blocks beyond the east edge of town. In the 1890s, that was on this corner right here, the corner of Center Avenue and 11th Street. This is just north of Hornbacher's, uh, a couple of blocks. But in the 1890s, there were three, four houses on this cor block out here. Uh, a lady named Kitty Raymond had one here on the, on the corner for many years, for about 20 years. Uh, Lou Elliott, May Block, uh, and another one that changed hands fairly regularly down the street. This is a Sanborn fire insurance map from October of 1899. These are highly detailed street maps that were drawn to cities all over the country to provide fire insurance companies a detailed information about individual buildings. And this one shows uh, this neighborhood out here. Here's Front Street or Center Avenue and this is 11th Street right here and there are four houses here and houses of ill fame. Now, everybody knew what was going on out here, but nobody really talked about it in polite conversation. The idea was if you segregated this kind of activity to a particular part of town, a couple of blocks beyond the edge of the city, if people wanted to go out there, they could do so without really any problem at all. But if people wanted to avoid the area, and most people avoided it like the plague, uh, they could easily do that as well. Now, we have the municipal court records for the city of Moorhead during the time frame. And re regulars clockwork, first of the month, all four of these ladies had traipsed downtown and placed their, uh, paid their $50 fine for keeping a house of, of prostitution. And it, it's amazing. This was really was more a form of, of uh, uh, taxation and, and zoning, really, than it was any kind of law enforcement. Uh, so you have to wonder, you know, where were city fathers in all this? Uh, they're supposed to enforce the laws and protect us from criminality. Well, many of the problems that Moore had had in the 1890s, you really have to put on the head of this guy. This is Arthur G. Lewis. Art Lewis was mayor of Moorhead throughout most of the 1890s. His obituary claimed that he was a very generous man, and I believe that. Uh, everything I've read about Art Lewis suggests that uh, if there was uh, the breadwinner in your family was having difficulties, if he was ill, couldn't raise money, uh, Art Lewis would be the first one to reach into his pocket to help out. Uh, but he ran the city, unfortunately, the same way. Not only did he allow the saloons to run 24-7, the gambling go on, the red light district he left alone, but he just really ran the place into the ground financially. Uh, in the 1890s, in the mid-1890s, we had a nationwide depression, one of the worst in the country's history. So how did the city of Moorhead respond? Well, they paved the streets. Uh, this is Center Avenue, looking uh, west 
uh, toward 4th Street. And these guys have laid out fir planks to provide a nice flat surface. And then they have cedar logs that are cut into blocks about 8 inches long. And they stand these lo uh, blocks on end like a big jigsaw puzzle. They put sand down in between them, and that's what people ran their horses and buggies on in the 1890s. It was uh, much better than the mud streets that we had before that. Uh, but it was very expensive. And before they put in the paving, they put in a whole new water system and a whole new sewer system, all of it with borrowed money. They built a municipally owned water and power plant that the city still owns today, again, all with borrowed money. It put people to work. It put money into people's pockets. But the city kept going deeper and deeper into debt. By the late 1890s, the city of Moorhead couldn't pay its bills on a day-to-day -day basis. They had to issue city warrants, or basically an IOU. In this case, they couldn't afford to pay Bent Elstead the $52.62 they owed him for as much salary as a, as a policeman. So they gave him this. Uh, Bent held on to it, took it down to his bank, and cashed it. And then once the city was able to scratch up enough money to pay it off, plus interest, uh, the bank could do that. That's how they were doing business on a day-to-day -day basis. You have to wonder, why did people in Moorhead put up with it for as long as they did? Well, in we went through the 1900 U.S. Census. That lists uh, not only everybody in town, but what they did for a living. And in 1900, we found that one person in 10 in the city of Moorhead owed their incomes directly to the saloons. Either they uh, worked in a saloon, they owned one, or their parents did. And one person in 10... Uh, who came into, say, Louis Fridlinson's meat market here, came in with saloon money in his pocket. So they put up with it for a long time. But eventually, in the late 1890s, high taxes put people over the edge. And in the spring of 1898, people from Moorhead got together in a big hall downtown, and they drafted somebody to run for mayor to clean up city government. And they picked kind of an unlikely hero. This is Jacob Kiefer. Jake Kiefer was a saloon owner. And the newspapers in Fargo and the Twin Cities had a real field day with this. They said, my goodness sakes, now Moorhead has uh, 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 elected a saloon or mayor. What's going to happen there now? Well, everybody in town knew that whatever else Jake Kiefer might be, he was a good businessman. And that was really what the city needed at the time. Kiefer knew that when he came into office, he wouldn't be able to shut down the saloons. Uh, that would be a death knell for the community, except for the two colleges, MSUM today and Concordia College. The saloons is about all the city had. But he knew that things had to be run on a much more efficient basis. So the first thing he did when he became mayor in the spring of 1898, he had appointed a commission to investigate the water and power plant. Turns out the manager of the power plant had been keeping two sets of books. On the one hand, he was claiming to the city he was netting the city $8,000 a year in profits. Turned out it was losing the city about $8,000 every year. And one of the problems was none of the saloon owners had ever paid to have their water and power hooked up. And uh, they weren't paying their bills. Instead, they were paying kickbacks to the city uh, recorder and the manager of the power plant. You can remember John Haas and his 400 electric light bulbs. Well, he could keep those running, burning all night long because he never paid his bills. Well, these guys lost their job, and the city started on a, uh, a period of reform. And uh, it, it was a very successful one. Within eight years, essentially, the city of Moorhead was basically out of debt. This is Tom Murphy. Thomas Murphy was uh, Jake Kiefer's chief of police, and he also did some good things. He was a brave cop. He got shot once in the line of duty. Uh, he added extra patrolmen in the fall to maintain order, got some better lighting done on the Main Avenue Bridge. But um, he saw some things that the mayor wanted him to see, and he avoided some things that the, he, the mayor would just as soon have him avoid. It was an appointed position. The mayor appointed him. So, among other things, they let the saloons run 24-7, uh, they let the gambling go on, and most importantly for people in Moorhead, they didn't do anything about the red light district. That took a series of other mayors, reform mayors, that followed in the early 20th century. In 1900, Hans Aker, the head of Concordia College, was elected mayor. Many local histories accredit him with being the one that cleaned up Moorhead and, and the saloons, but that's not really accurate. Uh, Aker was uh, a very active guy. He got dozens and dozens of arrests of saloon owners for selling after hours on a, and on Sunday. Never got a single conviction. 
Uh, he was a very active fellow, served one term, but uh, fairly inept as a mayor. Another guy that did some good was William Tillotson. He was elected in 1903, and uh, among other things, uh, he knocked down the red light district out on the east end of town. Uh, that did away with uh, that part of a problem, but actually made it worse in many ways because it suddenly scattered to all parts of town. And for the first time, you started seeing uh, ladies of the evening show up in the saloons, and it actually made it more difficult to police. Now, these changes weren't happening in a vacuum. It was a general period of reform all over the country. In 1906, the U.S. government passed the Pure Food and Drug Act, and up until this time, the brewers have been selling beer as a beverage of entertainment. This is an old-style lager beer ad from uh, the Moorhead Daily News from 1906, and you can see that uh, uh, beer is pure, it's wholesome, it's nourishing, it's absolutely uh, pure, it's good for you. Here we've got Uncle Sam boning up on the National Pure Food and Drug Act while he's quaffing an old-style lager beer. This is another ad from the Moorhead Daily News. This is about 1910 or so. This is a Pabst Blue Ribbon beer ad, of course. And we've got a family at a picnic, and they're all drinking beer. Even the ladies are holding glasses. This little boy right here might have a beer in front of him, because the, but we can't tell because this tree is strategically placed in his way. This is quite extraordinary. Fifteen years before this, no self-respecting woman in Moorhead would have been caught dead anywhere near a saloon. And here we have a family, presumably drinking beer at a family picnic. Now there's a lot of pushback, of course, against all the problems that Moore had had. Uh, the temperance movement was very active in this area all throughout the 19th century, the late 19th century. Uh, it was The temperance movement was a, uh, a mix of all kinds of disparate elements, all sorts of different folks that had different ideas that had one thing in common basically and that was their, their horror and uh, hatred of alcohol. The WCTU, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, was very active throughout this whole time period. Progressives, people that thought that uh, uh, all the society's ills could be solved through governmental action uh, were uh, in favor of temperance and against the saloons. Nativists, uh, people that didn't trust or didn't like Eastern and Southern Europeans coming into the country in the early 20th century, uh, they assumed uh, that they were heavy drinkers, uh, were also part of the temperance movement, and especially churches, and particularly uh, evangelical Protestant churches. Women's groups uh, got deeply, deeply involved in the temperance movement. The temperance movement was really the first political movement in the United States uh, that uh, women became uh, deeply involved in. The Congregational Church uh, Ladies Aid Group here in Moorhead was uh, very active as well as the WCTU. The WCTU had a rule that said that all their members had to be native-born uh, white women. Uh, there were a lot of Norwegians and Swedes here in this area who started a Scandinavian branch of the WCTU. Uh, north of Holly, there was a Viking Temperance Society who was made up of local people up there that were very active. A number of other temperance societies around the county as well. Well, these folks that didn't like the saloons in Moorhead had a tool that they could use to try to get rid of them. Minnesota had what was known as a local option law. That meant that the residents of a village, a city, or a township could vote yes or no to whether or not to allow saloons in their village, city, or township. And the rural areas are much more dry than the cities of Moorhead and Barnesville. By 1914, all Clay County villages had voted uh, to go dry under local option. Georgetown was the last one in 1914. They had elections in Barnesville and Moorhead, and they voted wet because uh, uh, the liquor interests are just too strong there. Uh, but these folks here, Norwegian Lutherans from out in the eastern part of Clay County, decided to do something about that. They needed a different tool to get rid of these saloons in Moorhead and Barnesville. And they got one in 1915. Uh, in 1915, 1914, Frank Peterson, this guy right here, was elected mayor uh, or elected to the uh, Minnesota legislature to the Senate from the Moorhead District. Uh, and he threw in with an organization called the Anti Saloon League, the single most successful special interest group in U.S. history. The Anti Saloon League, unlike the uh, progressives and the other people that were involved with the uh, temperance movement, uh, weren't interested in. Oh, uh, the eight-hour workday or child labor or women's rights, uh, they were 
interested in one thing, and that was to get rid of the saloons. And they would work with any politician anywhere, no matter how sleazy the guy might be, as long as he voted the way that they wanted to on the saloon issue, they would support him to the hill. And they were very, very aggressive and very, very successful. They helped uh, Moorhead Senator F.H. Peterson pass a county option bill in the Minnesota legislature in 1915. That meant the residents of the entire county could vote yes or no on, on the issue. And almost as soon it was, as it was passed, uh, f- temperance folks from all over Clay County got together in the basement of this church right here, Swed- the old Swedish Lutheran Church, Bethesda Lutheran Church. And they called themselves the No License Law Enforcement League of Clay County. No liquor licenses allowed is what they wanted. And uh, uh, they quickly drafted a petition calling for a countywide election for May 17, 1915. That's sitting the mind, Norwegian Constitution Day. Uh, they picked that specifically, so they figured it was a good way for Scandinavian Lutherans to get out and celebrate their heritage by voting out these evil saloons in Moorhead. They quickly got twice the number of signatures necessary to put it on the ballot, and uh, the drives that year won by a huge majority, uh, 2,586 to 1,527. Uh, voters of the entire county voted dry, except for a few precincts in Moorhead and Barnesville. Uh, they voted wet, but the whole rest of the county voted dry. And on the 30th of June, 1915, exactly 25 years to the day after the saloons in Fargo closed, saloons in Moorhead went out in a blaze of glory. Uh, biggest crowd in the history of the city on Front Street. People were firing off cannons and firecrackers, Roman candles, singing how dry I am till the wee hours of the morning. And then finally people staggered home, sobered up, and more had started on a whole new phase of its history. I'm Mark Peel, Archivist for the Historical and Cultural Society of Clay County. Thanks for listening.